Uh, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for the delay in starting. We were in private session. Uh, we're now in public session. We just wait by day. Okay. Uh, before we begin, can I remind all members uh, to please turn off their mobile phones completely as they may interfere with the recording equipment. Uh, the minutes of the meeting 27th of February 2019 have been circulated. Are the minutes agreed? Agreed. Uh, I now turn to correspondence. The first item of correspondence is a letter which we issued as a committee uh, to, our, to our clerk, uh, to Ray Walsh, Corporate Affairs and Licensing Director, Football Association of Ireland, concerning the scheduled meeting uh, with the Joint Committee on Wednesday, the 10th of April 2019, seeking clarification on certain matters and further information on other matters. Uh, we, the request which we got back was to have the meeting brought forward to the 3rd of April. Our committee has agreed to schedule a meeting on that date with Sports Ireland because Sports Ireland are the body responsible for governance, oversight and scrutiny of sporting bodies. Our scheduled meeting with the FAI, the committee has agreed, will proceed on the 10th of April as planned. The committee, through our clerk, on the 22nd of March, requested from the Football Association of Ireland uh, three, three issues. One, we sought confirmation as a matter of urgency the date in early April when the FAI governance review would be completed and confirmation that the outcomes of that review would be brought to the attention of this joint committee well in advance of our meeting scheduled for the 10th of April. It was also item three. It was also noted from public statements that the Football Association of Ireland were willing to meet Minister Ross and Sports Ireland to give more detail on a bridging loan from the Chief Executive to the FAI in 2017, and a request that full and comprehensive detail of this matter would be forwarded to the Joint Committee in advance, clearly and well in advance of the meeting, which is currently scheduled for the 10th of April. So we have, we, we, uh, and we now ask, and we have received no reply to that correspondence, uh, which has said, uh, we would now ask that the FAI would now supply this information urgently and at the earliest possible opportunity to commit to our committee and well in advance of our proposed meeting uh, on the 10th of April. So that's been the decision of, of the committee. I now turn to other correspondence. Uh, this is correspondence item 2019-419. Uh, it is noted this correspondence uh, that Mr Ford Asiya was not covered by FOI. It's proposed that Mr. this is a letter uh, from a member of the public uh, that he contact the FOI commissioner as regards to that body. Is that agreed? Agreed? That Sorry, yeah. uh, correspondence. Sure. Um, Keira, would it be any harm for ourselves as a committee just to raise his questions to maybe just write to um, CAE or the, and or the department, yeah. just looking for them to um, investigate the, the details of the letter and, and respond accordingly, maybe? Of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyway, regardless, uh, outside of FOI, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's fine. Uh, correspondence, 2019-420. Uh, it's a, a, an email from Minister Ross uh, replying to an email from our clerk. Supposed to note this correspondence. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence 2019-421. Uh, it's proposed to note this item of correspondence. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence 2019-422. Uh, uh, it's an email uh, from Councillor Michael O'Brien who states that without prior consultation notification of local commuters, Irish Rail decided to withdraw all staffing from Clon Griffin's statement on the 16th of February. Could I ask that we would forward that to the appropriate uh, Irish Rail again for their, for their comments on it? For yeah, Director Blaine. Exclusively that station, we might ask what changes, changes have happened elsewhere. That's where as well. Right, so we'll raise that as well. And a, why? And why. Okay. We I understand that, because it, it contradicts the recommendations that we as a committee mm -hmm. had in the disability access report yeah. you know and it flies in the face of all of that and these particular issues around the manning of stations was a huge um, issue for a lot of people it was one of the main issues that they found that was, they were yeah. yeah so it um both the, the irish rail and um the nta fine and i think the minister is due to come in 
uh, to report two weeks time, two in two weeks' time on all of that, uh, three weeks' time. So we'll make sure that, that we copy that to the Minister as well, if that's okay. Uh, correspondence 2019-423 AMB. Um, it's proposed to note this item of correspondence as this meeting has actually been scheduled uh, for the 8th of May 2019. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, correspondence 2019-424. Proposed to note this item of correspondence as that's also part of the meeting for the 8th of May. Agreed. Agreed. Correspondence 2019-425-A, B, C, D, E and F. Proposed this, to note this item in the context of our work programme as scheduled as soon as possible. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence 2019-426-A, B and C. Uh, note, we propose to note this correspondence. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, co uh, correspondence is an email which I received from uh, a number of people, a letter uh, from Simon McNamara, UK and Ireland, Country Manager of the International Air Transport Association, and also a letter uh, from uh, Mr McNamara seeking a meeting with me as Chairman to discuss Irish, the Irish aviation industry and look at possible ways of working together. So I presume we'd invite him into the committee, wouldn't that be it? Pardon? And put in a work program at the appropriate time. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence 2019-428 AB. Uh, it's proposed to note this correspondence discussed earlier. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence item 2019-429. Uh, this is uh, again an email from Deputy Rock. It's proposed to note this correspondence as discussed earlier. Agreed. Correspondence, another email to me as Chairman. Uh, regarding the issue in relation to, to Bus Connect, which is a matter for discussion today. Is that agreed? Agreed. Correspondence item 2019-432-AB, uh, proposed to note this correspondence. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, correspondence 219-433, it's an email uh, from a, a, a person, a member of the public, who's concerned about the National Transport Authority and how they operate. So I propose we, we forward that correspondence to them. And he's picked a particular concern, so I note they're nodding in agreement there. Uh, so we now turn to EU scrutiny. Yeah, Sorry, excuse me. In relation to the work programme, yeah. we did quite a bit of work around Christmas time on yeah. cycling. Um, and uh, do we have the cycling campaign scheduled in for uh, for a hearing in our work programme? I, I remember us identifying that as one of the items we wanted to do in the first half of this year. It's a key part of the programme, Paul. Is that, yeah. Is, are we likely to do it before after, the, after, after Easter? Right, OK. After Easter. Right. OK, EU scrutiny, uh, Schedule A. Uh, so come 2017-648, proposed as this proposal warrants further scrutiny and it is further proposed to request the Department update the committee once its examination of, the, of its implications uh, of the reporting obligations contained within the proposal has concluded. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, and this has come 2019-38. It is proposed there are no subsidiarity concerns with this proposal. It is also proposed to retain this come for further scrutiny. It is further proposed to clarify with the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport if the CO2 emissions report attached uh, is attached to individual countries. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, now, and then we have Schedule B. I'm required to read all these uh, numbers here and so, uh, Schedule B, the, the following uh, proposals uh, war, it is, which are listed warrant no further scrutiny. That is, come 2017 289, 2015 661, 2016 31, 2016 617, 2016 693, 2016 694, 2017 279, 2018 288, 2018 559, 2018. 853, 2018, 854, 2019, 56, 2019, 72, 2019, 80, 2019, 91, 2019, 92, 2019, 121, 2019, 122. And as I said, this is proposed that these uh, items warrant no further scrutiny. Okay, so move on now to the purpose of this meeting. Uh, bus connects and Metrolink. The purpose of today's meeting is to continue our committee's consideration of bus connects and the Metrolink. In this regard, I would particularly like to welcome from the NTA Ms Anne Graham, Chief Executive Officer, and Mr Hugh Cregan, Deputy Chief Executive Officer. Uh, you, you are both very welcome. Uh, before we commence, and for the purpose 
of witnesses attending in accordance with procedure, I'm required to read the following. By virtue of sec section 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respect of the evidence you are to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charge against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against either a person outside the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I now invite Ms Anne Graham, Chief Executive Officer of National Transport Authority, to please make her, uh, her opening presentation. Thank you. Chairperson, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to attend. I understand that the committee wishes to focus upon the current situation pertaining to bus connects and Metrolink. To assist me in dealing with your subsequent questions, I'm joined by Hugh Cregan, Deputy CEO with the Authority. Bus Connects. The Bus Connects programme of works consists of many strands, all combining to provide a more efficient and more attractive bus service in our cities and towns. Last year, we started the work on Bus Connects Dublin and carried out a major public consultation on a revised network for Dublin's bus services. We received over 30,000 submissions and we are continuing to work on the revisions to the proposed network. This work will be completed this summer. However, in deference to the requests received from public representatives, we will commence the consultation on the revised network in September this year. Bus Connects Bus Corridors. The aim of Bus Connects is to transform Dublin's bus system uh, with the Bus Connects Core Bus Corridor project providing 230 kilometres of dedicated bus lanes and 200 kilometres of cycle lanes on 16 of the busiest bus corridors in and out of the city centre. This project is fundamental to addressing the congestion issues in the Dublin region, with the population due to grow by 25% by 2040, bringing it to almost 1.55 million. Bus services provide the main form of public transport across Dublin, with 67% of public transport journeys each day made by bus. The level of commuting to work by bicycle has also increased by 43% since 2011, and the need for better and safer cycling facilities will be provided through the rollout of the Core Bus Corridor project. The first phase of the public consultations commenced in November 2018, with the second phase starting in January 2019 and the third phase commencing on the 26th of February 2019. The closing dates for the consultation have been extended by one month on all phases as follows. Phase 1 on the 29th of March, Phase 2 on the 30th of April and Phase 3 on the 31st of May. Since the launch of Phase 1 of the Bus Connects Corpus Corridors, the Bus Connects customer service team has responded to approximately 1,000 calls a total of 2,400 emails and web forms have been received to date, which are a combination of queries, information requests and submissions. Over 3,500 uh, 3 hard copies of brochures have been issued. Since November 2018, representatives from the NTA have met nearly 230 property owners regarding the current proposals. This equates to about 15% of all affected property owners seeking a one-to-one -one meeting. Over 1,200 uh, people have attended the 12 public information events that have been held for Phase 1 and Phase 2 corridors since November uh, to date. Phase 3 public information events are commencing this week, Bray to City Centre and UCD to Ballsbridge on Tuesday and Wednesday respectively. A total of 11 community forum meetings have also been held for Phase 1 and Phase 2 corridors with approximately 700 attendees, in total representing community groups, residents, associations and other organisations. The Phase 3 Community Forum will commence in two weeks. Metrolink. Last year, the National Transport Authority and Transport Infrastructure Ireland published the emerging preferred route for a north-south high-frequency metro line linking Swords, Dublin Airport, through the city centre to Sandyford, connecting with heavy rail, DART, bus and Lewis services thereby creating a more integrated public transport system in the Greater Dublin area. The proposal was the merger of two projects, Metro North and Metro South, which have been proposed for over two decades and which were included in the transport strategy for the Greater Dublin area 2016 to 2035, developed by the Authority and approved by the then Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport. 
Metrolink, Bus Connects and Dart Expansion are three major transport infrastructure projects included in Project Ireland 2040. Together they will enable the development of reliable, sustainable, affordable, integrated public transport that will support the economy, help Ireland meet its climate change targets and make Dublin a better place to live, work and shop or visit. The public consultation on the emerging preferred route was held between March and May of 2018. Both TII and the NTA have reflected on the views expressed and have responded in the design of the preferred route which was published yesterday. We believe that the preferred route proposed will address many of the concerns and deliver a better project. Among the most significant changes is the proposal that the construction of the Metrolink in the Moby Road area will no longer require the acquisition of the playing fields of Nafina uh, uh, Club. In consultation with Home Farm uh, Football Club, we now propose to construct a more compact station under their pitch. The pitch will be unavailable during the estimated three-year construction process, but will be fully restored afterwards. A second significant change is the arrangement around Charlemont. The route we published last year included a proposal to upgrade the Green, uh, Lewis Green Line to Metro Standard in line with the transport strategy for the Greater Dublin area. It is projected that the number of people seeking to travel on the Green Line in future years will exceed the carrying capacity of the Lewis system, requiring an upgrade. However, that upgrade is not expected to be needed for some time, perhaps 20 years or so. During and following the consultation on the emerging preferred route, a concern arose about the need to close the Green Line for a prolonged period during its upgrade to Metro service and the tie-in of the tunnel section of Metrolink. Acknowledging these concerns, an alternative approach has been developed that allows the new section of Metro Line to be built now, with the Green Line conversion to Metro to occur at an appropriate, at an appropriate point in the future. The plan we published yesterday is to develop the section from Swords to Charlemont with an interchange from Metro to Lewis at Charlemont. The required tunnel boring works to allow we'll continue. The required tunnel boring works to allow the future connection to the existing Lewis line will be completed as part of this current phase. In the city centre, changes have been made to the plan that will reduce disruption and make it easier for other public transport services to continue to operate during construction. In O'Connell Street, an opportunity has arisen to create an integrated station under what was the old Carlton development site. The location and construction of the station in the original proposal would have presented a significant challenge to Lewis services, bus services and vehicular traffic on O'Connell Street. We are working with the owners of this property with a view to integrating the O'Connell station into the proposed site development. Disruption in St Stephen's Green area will also be reduced under the new plans. This station will be located as pre previously proposed at Stephen's Green East, but we are now moving it slightly south so that Hume Street can remain open during construction and slightly west so as to avoid closing the road during construction. This also means we can avoid a major sewer that would otherwise require diversion. St Stephen's Green Park itself will be impacted to a small extent as a result. In Ballymontu, the station is to move a short distance. It would now lie adjacent to the R108, partly under the site of the old shopping centre, where plans are in place for a new mixed-use quarter following its demolition. This will cause far less disruption during construction and we believe is a much better all-round solution for Ballymun. The number of homes that will need to be acquired for the project has been reduced in the preferred route we published yesterday. For an example, uh, an apartment building near Glasnevin Station, which is currently home to about 40 people, will no longer need to be acquired. However, despite a significant effort on behalf of TII and the NTA, it has not been possible to relocate the Metrolink station at Tara to avoid the acquisition of College Gate Apartments and the Markovich Sport and Fitness Centre. Both NTA and TII will take whatever measures we can to mitigate the impact on residents and leisure centre users. We propose to assist residential tenants to secure alternative accommodation and pay the costs of their new accommodation for up to one year. For owner-occupier apartments, we will provide assistance in locating and securing an alternative property in addition to paying appropriate compensation. With regard to the Sport and Fitness Centre, we are consulting with Dublin City Council on a plan to build a replacement facility. Public consultation on the preferred route for Metrolink has now commenced and will continue until the 21st of May 2019. There will be a number of public information events at various venues over the coming weeks. It's expected that a railway order application will be made in 2020, with a decision from Ambor Planala anticipated in the following year. Construction is likely to take six to seven years. And just to remind ourselves of the benefits, there will be many benefits of the Metrolink project, which will support the future development and growth of Dublin's capital city. 
It will greatly enhance public transport capacity and accessibility to the city centre and the surrounding corridor for commuters, businesses, retail, education, tourism and the overall sustainability of the city. There will be an improvement for domestic and international travel connections provided by access to and from Dublin Airport and through the National Rail and Road Network. There will be decreased road traffic congestion on journeys to and from the airport and crossing the city from north to south. Metrolink will include a park and ride for over 3,000 vehicles at Estuary Swords. There will be faster journey times with high frequency and high reliability by Metrolink between Swords, the airport and the city centre. There will be more integrated and improved quality of interchanges with Lewis, Dart, rail and bus transport hubs across the city with more direct journey opportunities. Metrolink can enhance social inclusion, providing new links from urban areas of Dublin to jobs and services in the city and across the suburbs. The project will support both the regeneration of existing areas and the development of new areas. It will generate employment during construction and operation and will support economic growth once operational. The metro system will support the environment by promoting a modal shift from car to public transport. This will help reduce emissions and energy consumption in addition to improving air quality and reducing road congestion. And that concludes my statement. Thank you very much. We now go to the normal process. We take Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, uh, Sinn Féin, then uh, party leaders and independents. So, Deputy Rock. Uh, first of all, uh, good to see you both again. Uh, glad to be at the launch of your revised Metrolink proposals yesterday. I think, uh, speaking on behalf of certainly myself and the other deputies uh, within my constituency, uh, we all shared a, a satisfaction with the revision of the plans. And indeed, I, I personally would view it as public consultation at its best. Uh, you took the views of the community on board, you listened to those views, you considered those views, you provided a revised document, and I think from my perspective that revised document is very welcome. So thank you very much for your work to date on that. Um, I'll go into my questions. In the publication it says site number 31, uh, the Northwood station, will share with residential and business facilities. I understand Transport Infrastructure Ireland, uh, yourselves and Dublin City Council are in discussion with the local club Ballymont Kickhams with regard to this site. Uh, can you tell us a, a bit more about your knowledge of those deliberations? Um, secondly, the ventilation shaft uh, in Albert College Park, what sort of disruption is envisaged there? Um, the, the documentation is entirely clear about time scale, scope, etc. Et I assume it's slightly less disruptive than, say, a station construction. Um, but I'd like a bit more detail on that. Particularly, will any clubs or playing facilities be affected? Uh, thirdly, uh, obviously the biggest change in this is that the south side element of it has been dropped. Um, would you both say you were disappointed uh, to lose that aspect of it? Uh, and would you agree that, unfortunately, uh, it was a necessity um, given uh, the lack of viable alternatives on the table? Uh, fourthly, then, um, the previous position um, which I think Mr Cregan had said within this committee, uh, was that the design team, when design works conclude on the Metrolink project, would be assigned to the Finglas Lewis project. Uh, is that still the case? Um, I'll go through my, my bus connects questions, if, if the chair will allow, um, and then we might. Yeah, we'll take all the questions together, and then the, the, the witnesses can... Right, yeah, I presume we're doing... Are we doing all Metrolink? I think one, well, well, or we, we just we'll do, do both. We'll right. do both. Yeah. Right, you be. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. You are <laughs> right, you be. Right, you be. Um, okay. So, with regard to bus connects, then, um, is Movie Road strictly necessary for a bus corridor, uh, given the revised Metrolink plans announced yesterday? Um, quite a lot of changes and disruption will take place along that stretch of road. Um, is it strictly necessary to restrict uh, vehicular traffic in one direction? Uh, to facilitate a bus corridor, given it will have effectively the best transport link in the country running underneath the road. Um, corridors 1, 4 and 6, in my view, appear to have lower impact, given there is no one-way required or no, or uh, relatively little by way of garden acquisition or acquire, uh, required. Is there an argument to proceed with these ahead, uh, or is there a sequential order that you have in mind with regard to rolling out these corridors? Um, with regard to the routes, um, how is the redesign going? Um, when will you reveal uh, the second iteration of the draft with regard to the routes? Uh, would you agree with the previous assertion that changing 10% of the routes would undo the project was unhelpful? Uh, and finally, would you say that branding both the core bus corridors aspect of Bus Connects 
and the route redesign aspect of Bus Connects uh, proved to be somewhat confusing given they're both under the brand umbrella of Bus Connects and that for regular members of the public uh, the constant sequential almost cascade of consultations, dates, deadlines and consultations is proving confusing <laughs> for some elected representatives to follow frankly let alone members of the public. They're my questions. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Curran. Chairman and Ms. Graham, thank you very much for your opening statement. Um, I suppose for, I'll start with in the same sequence, uh, reflecting on the Metro Link, which was announced yesterday. Another version of it, I suppose. My comment is we've seen a lot of versions, and in your opening statement, um, if you add the timelines together, to deliver this project will take in or around 10 years. So it's a, it's a long way down the road before it becomes operational, and that has an impact on questions I'll pose in, rela in relation to bus connects. The Metro, line, Metro Link, as published yesterday, has shrunken by about seven kilometres. So instead of being the original 26, it's 19. Previously, figures around the cost of Metro Link had been maybe around uh, 3 billion uh, for the longer one. What are the uh, costings around the revised uh, plan that you're presenting, that you presented yesterday? And I suppose I'm also interested to know, you know, what was this based on in terms of passenger traffic? What number of passengers was the original longer version, 26 kilometer Metro, line, Metro Link expected to carry? And what do you now expect to carry on the shorter one? Um, and I suppose what cost-benefit analysis, and I'm not opposed to Metrolink, but it is a substantial change. You've reduced the, you've reduced the, the overall Metro by about 30%, so it's a substantial change in project that is now a different proposal, and was that accompanied by a cost-benefit analysis? And I suppose, maybe being parochial, but I would make the point that when Metro, because you, you refer to it in your, yourself, you talk about Metro uh, North and Metro South over two decades, there was actually a Metro West, yeah. uh, and Metro West West, uh, I agree, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very unusual to have agreement, but I, I know uh, Metro West was also part of the jigsaw because it was to link to, to Metro North and in particular to point out that the western part of, of Dublin is where the population growth is. Uh, you know, we have two SDZs under physical construction as we speak, brand new towns of about uh, house, uh, with about 10,000 new housing units, you know you're sick and tired of listening to me when saying that the M50 between the N4 and N7, that section, is probably the, the busiest section of road anywhere where in the country. And Metro West was to have been an orbital route. I know at the time local authorities were making reserves of some land, and while it isn't included in the 2016 to 2035 uh, plan, that doesn't mean that the original concept isn't as valid today. And in light of the fact that you're shortening by seven kilometres metro, the metro link, my question is, should you not be cons cons uh, considering uh, an extension to the western part of the city, particularly linking Talla, Clondalk and Luke and Blanchardstown, that, that orbital route that accommodates two hospitals, two third level colleges, two major shopping centres. There's huge activity on that orbital route, not reflected, and, that, and you might comment on that. I want to just then briefly talk about Bus Connects. Um, I acknowledge that the next stage of the public consultation in relation to the network isn't taking place till after the summer, and thanks be to God for that, because people do want to engage with it and the summertime isn't appropriate so I, I, I do appreciate I, it might delay it a month or two but it is better that we have full and meaningful engagement. I want to express concern the whole idea of the network change was to shorten journey time more efficiencies and that. The problem I have and I've said it to you before is that the network changes are going to happen before the corridor changes come into place and the concern I have is that the journey times and efficiencies you're hoping to achieve won't, achieve won't be achieved. I have real, real concerns about it. I've looked at the corridors and, and one of them stands out as not having very many ha houses affected. I think only uh, maybe no more than 15 houses, which is the Lucan corridor, mainly along uh, a motorway that exists. And I'm wondering, should there be consideration given to trying to fast track that to demonstrate that the corridor and the network solutions being proposed are actually effective and that they would be accommodated uh, in addition with park and ride facilities. But I have real concerns that you're going to change the network in advance of the corridors and won't achieve the travel time. Uh, in particular, as you rightly point out in your opening statement, 
the increased population and traffic in, in and out of the city continues to grow, but these solutions that are being proposed are significantly down the road. And the final point I'd make is, as part of Bus Connects, year on year, until corridors and efficiencies come into place, uh, is there a programme to substantially increase the fleet of buses operating in the Dublin area, as, in parallel with the Bus Connects project? Thank you. Deputy Munster. <coughs> okay, thanks, Cahirlach. Um, I'll just start off with... Uh, Bus Connects, and um, from the initial publication of the plan, there's been 30,000 submissions, and um, whilst well, that's the public engagement um, and the, the opportunity to raise our concerns um, in such volumes is very welcome, but it, it takes you back to the, you know, sometimes would it not, not be better to engage with the public first and the communities in before putting a plan to them as to their their needs in relation to work, travel, you know, everything involved in their community, hospitals, all that sort of thing, as to what they actually need, what they feel they need before putting forward any plan. It, you know, it might, um, given the volume of submissions that were made, it might be something to look at in the future to engage with the public as to their needs um, first before for drawing up a plan. But um, Listening to people uh, living in Dublin and the outskirts of Dublin, it's the frequency of services and the increases in the, in the need for increased buses is the priority. Um, are, you know, on a daily basis, route changes appear to be way down their list, and I'm just wondering if you can, you know, you hear people say they stood there in, every morning and they've three buses passed them before they can actually get onto a bus. So I'm just wondering how uh, Bus Connect is going to solve that, that issue. Um, the other one people were wondering was why the NTA had made um, a written to property owners whose property or gardens are, are going to be directly affected. But there's, there appears to be no contact with other property owners um, living in areas where, say, trees are completely to be, to be cut down or you know, alterations to footpaths and all that sort of thing, and I'm just wondering, have you any plans for that? Um, in relation to the Metrolink, um, another deputy had raised the issue of the Metro West, but in your report here, your, um, you had talked about uh, assisting uh, people losing homes, and, and uh, I'm just wondering if you could provide more details on what plans you have to assist those um, you were saying about uh, owner, occupier and tenants are to be given a year's compensation. In your statement you say up to a year, so is it a year or, or, or not? And given the, um, the spiralling cost of rents, how, how will that, the, the rate be calculated and how will property, or property compensation um, or compensation for property owners be calculated also on, and do you have an idea of the overall cost of, of this part of the project? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Murphy, and then Deputy Coppinger, if that's okay. Yeah. Just picking up on, on a point, just picking up on a point that I think several of us are probably going to make, and, and that is the, um, okay, the, some of the changes to Metrolink, I think, have shown that there's an, that the organisation has listened to some of the concerns, and uh, and it's very welcome that, that, that there has been a response uh, to that, particularly on the north side, um, uh, the, the, the solutions on the north side of, of the city. Um, but if you were to look at what the transport needs are, the census of population for the last maybe three or four census would be a pretty useful way of, 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 of predicting what's going to happen into the future. And the city centre and Dunleary, for example, grew both by 13% over those 20 years. But if you start looking at South Dublin, 22%, Fingal, well over 40%, Mead, Kildare, over 40% each, and Wicklow just under 30%. So we can see where the, the population shifts are happening. And you'd only have to take a flight over Dublin to actually see where the space is, uh, to see where it's going to continue to grow, irrespective of the amount of land that's owned. Um, and as well as looking what's in a plan, 
what's not in it is a is, is a, a, a key component um, and um, I, I think the west side of, of the city and looking where the traffic is generated which is outside of that again um, and not just the neighbouring counties but counties adjacent to that again is really where the, the commutes are happening and where that, that needs to be impacted and you, you might just address how that's going to be uh, dealt with in, from the point of view of rail because at the moment there's, there's capacity constraints um, in relation to heavy rail um, uh, and, and you'll be well aware of well aware of those and the length of time that it takes to get uh, new um, uh, new rolling stock. Um, so you might you might just address uh, that issue. Um, I, I won't even go with, with Dart Underground because I, I just give this meeting a skip on that because that I just think is the total missing piece in 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 in, in all of, in all of this. Um, the um, just in relation to your opening statement and um, the bottom of page three to the top of page four, the plan we published yesterday is to develop uh, the section from Swords to Charlemont with an interchange from Metro to Lewis at Charlemont. The required tun tun tunnel boring works uh, to allow future connection to the existing uh, Lewis uh, line will be completed as part of, of the current phase. That means that it's a predetermined route once the bore is is you know obviously completed you know is there you know is there the prospect then of any flexibility on that route if that is going to be um, proceeded with um, the um, just in relation to the, um, the the people that have to move in relation to college gate and the market sports center what kind of timeline would be would would be involved with that in relation to being able to put alternatives in place, um, and, and how do you go how do you go about that? Um, and in relation to advanced per, I mean, obviously predicting where lines will go is one thing. What kind of advanced purchase is required for the the trams? And in terms of the capacity constraints. Um, in terms of the capacity constraints uh, uh, that exist at the moment, um, is there any kind of issue in relation to which you know which comes first? Well, is, it's not likely to push out, for example, the purchase of um, of uh, much needed heavy rail um, in 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 order to uh, make sure that the orders go in for the um, uh, the new uh, metro trains. Um, and just in relation to 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 bus connects, uh, you, obviously there's there's public consultation on on this particular phase. When is the next phase? Um, uh, the the ones that were parked, if you like, uh, the outer uh, um, bus connects. When when are we likely to see that coming back in consultation on that? Thank you, uh, Deputy Coppinger. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm actually glad to hear deputies raising about West Dublin because uh, it just is a bit mystifying that when transport is being planned, the areas that have grown in population, as have already been outlined, are completely left bereft. Now, I'm absolutely delighted, by the way, about Metrolink to Swords because Swords is a hugely growing area as well. But I feel that it's been done more to uh, make it easier for people to get to and from the airport rather than for the people who live in Fingal. But that's fine, that's important. But if we want to take cars off the road on a daily, daily basis, we actually have to plan transport for you know, the suburbs. Um, so the south side has been dropped, but maybe you'd consider now thinking of West Dublin. Um, there was a plan for Metro West, I'll mention this briefly, when I was on Fingal County Council. And we agreed, or the councillors agreed on the council, to rezone Kellystown, to rezone, you know, Barn Hill, to rezone huge tracts of land for development on the basis of Metro West. Now, uh, Hansfield SDZ has been mentioned, which has been thrown up apace. Now, we want housing, absolutely, but there's no point in, um, you know, planning to build in the outer parts of Dublin, and we're talking basically on the border with Meath, 
uh, without providing transport. I was talking to Mr Cregan at the, the Bus Connects in Blanchardstown and I made this point that we actually need a Lewis to Blanchardstown. Like, this is not rocket science. If you're more than eight miles out of the city, you can't be just purely reliant on buses. You know, actually you need light rail to really get people to and from places very fast. Um, and I, I know uh, Mr Cregan argued that, well, we have this rail line that goes the rail line doesn't go to where the population has actually increased. People in Mulhuddard, people in Tyrrellstown, people in uh, you know, parts of Ongar can't get access to the rail line. And anyway, it's not frequent enough. I know it will be electrified at some point, and I, I welcome that, but it still won't cater for. For example, I, w I've designed or we've designed a proposal to extend the Lewis to, to Dublin 15 from Broombridge. That would be actually a very low density route, which would be quite, you know, relatively cheap to, to, to do. So you would be going from Broombridge to Connolly Hospital, uh, to IT Blanchardstown and to Blanchardstown Centre. Um, and the costing of that based on study and other uh, metro or, you know, light rail designs will be roughly speaking about uh, 45 million a kilometre or 315 million if you took that as a phase one. For, but we also have an additional problem that's bringing traffic into Blanchardstown. Okay, a good problem, but still a problem if you live there, is the fact that we have huge industrial parks. And we all welcome the fact that there's more jobs and multinationals, etc., setting up. But there's 20 or 30,000 people working in Ballycoolin and in all of these industrial parks, and they've no other way to get there except by driving. Um, and if you look at the, the, it's complete gridlock now with the recovery in the economy. And it doesn't seem to me that there's any onus on the companies that are setting up to make any additional contribution. For example, could there be a rates increase to pay for uh, a light rail system on top companies that are based there? Uh, so if you extend it from the shopping centre to Ballycoolin, for example, that would be another huge uh, relief for uh, thousands of people. And you could then look at a third phase to Little Pace, Ongar, and uh, again, you know, th this might sound like a lot of money, but actually there's a huge amount of uh, rates being paid in that area and a huge amount of taxes being paid. Um, and if we want to really get people out of cars in terms of climate change, I think that this is what's needed. Um, you've already mentioned in your submission that 67% of public transport journeys are by bus. We do need more light rail to, for the capacity. And I'll just finish with um, the Bus Connects. We've already spoken on this a lot, and one of the major problems with it is it was cutting some of the local bus services, or else it was making people make two journeys rather than one. And I wouldn't have a problem with the town centre being turned into a hub for, for a rail link, because you're getting lots of people off a little bus onto you know, a, a light rail directly into town, whereas the problem with the bus connects was people would be getting off one bus and then fighting to get in another because it just wouldn't be or hadn't been outlined whether there'd be sufficient increase to take up the slack. So I really would ask the NTA to strongly consider this is a serious proposal. We need a Lewis system for the 110,000 people who live in Greater Blanchardstown. The same applies to other areas, obviously in West Dublin, that were developed in the last 20 years. And it is very sad for people to see Again, Renla, which is just outside the city centre, why would you need a, a metro to Renla? You know, there'd be just no real need for that. Not in the sense of the same urgency for your eight and ten miles out of the city with with tens of thousands of people living there. So this is something that I feel is absolutely necessary and we have to campaign for and make it a big issue. Thank you. I just have a few uh, words of wisdom myself. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend you for your professionalism uh, for meeting. It's a very big challenge that you faced and we all face as a society and your commitment and your professionalism, your dedication, your interaction with the public, uh, I, I find absolutely 100% from, you know, from public servants uh, that you're always listening and ready to engage. The changes that you have made already, uh, you know, they're significant. Uh, they're as a result of a listening process. And I think that democracy is, is, is well served by interaction between communities and, and, and state bodies. Um, 
uh, and the very professional manner in which you conduct your business. And I have two questions for you, I have to have said that. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> one is, they're, they're easy questions, uh, provided you do them. <laughs> uh, one is, no, it's already I've raised it with you. I, I live in Drogheda, and obviously, clearly, uh, the, the estuary, the Malahide estuary proposed, uh, you know, a park and ride facility there. I know you plan ultimately that it would be 2,000 vehicles might be able to park there per day, and that would take a huge number of, of vehicles off the streets of Dublin. I'd just like to know where, where is that in your plans? Uh, the other question, I was speaking to Deputy Farrell yesterday, uh, I know he hopes to make it here, but it's a question of connectivity between the Metro and the Northern Rail Line links. As I understand it, you have to go into Tara Street before you can connect back up into the rail network. And he was making a point that there might be an opportunity to have another connection across to the, to the northern line. I don't know if you've considered that, uh, but you would have a lot of people who would be coming. You know, there's, huge, there's millions of people coming into Dublin Airport every every year, and a lot of them, their, uh, their other journeys could well be by the dart that you're going to have in that line and the existing, if you want to go to Belfast or whatever. Um, so they're, they're just questions I have. So thank you, and just if you can answer them. As if you can, if it's reasonable, uh, in the best way you, you wish. But make sure you get back to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind, Chairman, I'm going to ask Hugh to kick off first, and I might pick up on some of the other issues. Thank you. Uh, okay, start off, Deputy Rocky, you, you did a number of queries there. Uh, Northwest Station, Ballymun Kickhams, Transport Infrastructure Ireland have had a number of discussions with Dublin City Council and we're pretty certain we, we have a solution there that will be satisfactory to, to Ballymont Kickhams. I don't know how directly they've been involved yet in those discussions, but we're pretty confident that the, the, the concern is going to be adequately addressed and we don't see a problem there. On the intervention shaft in Albert uh, Park, that's a much smaller, con it's a considered piece of construction, but it's much smaller construction than the station. Um, I can't answer directly to say will we be interfering with any pitch on a temporary basis. If we are, I'm pretty confident we can sort that out with Dublin City Council and get a temporary replacement just, just for a short period. But it, uh, it's a much smaller affair than, than, than a full station. Um, on the southern section of the Green Line, are we disappointed to lose it? Uh, no, I think we've taken the right approach here. The, the Green Line will need to be upgraded in the future. It came up, I think, in, in a later question from somebody. Um, it, we're not upgrading the Green Line just to go to Ranelagh. It's to go to the places south of Ranelagh. It's, you know, Cherrywood is a town in itself. You've got Sandyford, which is growing, and there's an extension to go out to Bray. So to cater for all that in the future, that line will have to be upgraded to Metro. But it doesn't need to be done now, and we can definitely eke more out of the Green Line in the, in the meantime. So. We, we think it is the appropriate solution at this stage and allows us to proceed on with the project. On the, on the design team assigned to the Fingless Lewis, Pro Lewis project, yes, the, the, that, that's correct. That um, Between us and TI, we only have limited resources, so as soon as we're able to free some more resources from working on the, the, the other projects, uh, we committed previously we would start design work on the, the, the Lewis line to Finglas, which is part of the strategy, uh, and that will start later this year. When it will take some time to do, but we'll start work on it later this year. Uh, Moby Road, um, is it necessary given Metrolink? Moby Road is still a busy bus corridor. Metrolink uh, serves a lot of key destinations, but you will know yourselves from looking at the maps, there's quite a distance between stations, and there's a lot of side roads and other uh, places that, that need to be served there. So the bus system is still going to be really important up there, and uh, it's for that reason we, we, we do believe we need to proceed with the, with the, the Bus Connect project. I mean, briefly there, I mean, it, it does it still need to be a continuous core bus corridor, I suppose, is more the, the question. I mean, I'm not saying there shouldn't be you know, no bus services along that corridor, but given the, yes. the, the resource that will be running beneath it, I presume your answer is yes. Yeah, the the yeah. answer is yes. Yeah. We could do a longer <laughs> one, but the short answer is yes. Uh, on a, a sequence to construct the various corridors, we quite genuinely have not worked out uh, a sequence to do it. I, I take the point from Deputy Curran that the Lucan Corridor has a lower number of properties and, and is much simpler in a lot of respects. And when we come to work through a sequence, we, we, we you know, I think that will be a 
considerable consideration at that stage. What we do know is we cannot do all the corridors at one time. We've said that here before. They do have to be sequenced, and we just need to get a bit further in the design process before we work out the sequencing. On the network redesign and how that is progressing, uh, we are still going through the 30,000 submissions. In parallel, we are working on picking up the issues from those submissions and looking what the intervention might be. Uh, we will have that done um, in a number of months, and as we said earlier, we'll kick off a second round of consultation uh, at the start of September. And finally, uh, we do understand that it does cause confusion when we're talking about bus connects and we're talking about bus lanes one day and bus services the other day. Uh, I think it's still confusing no matter what we call it. If we call it something completely different, there'll still be a level of confusion. And we've tried to simplify our language in, in, in moving towards bus services and bus lanes when we're talking to people, but we accept that there's so much going on here, it, it inevitably causes confusion. Uh, I, Metrolink, it is, I should say, Metrolink is the scheme going from Swords to uh, south of Charmont. The overall Metro scheme will eventually go to Sandyford as, as per the original intention. On the costing of the plan, but what we said yesterday at the launch and what we put in our brochure is we want to, to, to get an accurate and fully developed cost estimate, you need to have settled on the design and you need to have the design further developed. We're still in a consultation. You can see the level of change from the first phase to now. So it's our intention that when we get the design moved on further, we start preparing a business case and later this year we'll bring it, we'll develop a very robust and solid cost estimate. There's a, an international person that we brought on board to guide us and assist us on this. He's a guy called Professor Brent, Brent Flyberg, and he's involved in large mega projects around the world uh, in, in dealing with cost and estimation issues. So he's been brought in about six months ago, I should say, it's quite a while ago, to give assistance and advice on how to put this together properly. So later this year, uh, we'll have developed our position much further we will be preparing a full business case on this, and that full business case will be made publicly available. Uh, I interrupt on that point, just very briefly, one, because I, and I won't come back to it again. I suppose the point I'm trying to make, Mr. Craig, is you've made a substantial change from the, from the larger Metro project to Metro Link, and I suppose what I'm trying to determine is, is it value for money versus the full scheme? You've cut seven kilometres. What's the cost benefit? How many passengers? And so forth. Um, and, and that's not transparently obvious. I suppose that was what I was trying to get at. I was just going to try to come to this. <laughs> Sorry, but well, that's fair enough. So, um, have we carried out a cost benefit analysis? Was one of the questions. The answer is no, not yet, but we will. But we've done enough of work to satisfy ourselves that. Uh, there's a very high level of passenger flow with people interchanging at Charlemont. Because remember, it's, it's the same journey is still possible. People just have to make a, a change at Charlemont Station and get off to Lewis and onto the Metro. So again, as part when, when we move on with design work, we, we'll finish that out, but we're absolutely confident it's value for money. And in terms of the, the, the numbers that we're the size of the metro, it's, it's been sized for the same size, so it will handle up to 20,000 passengers uh, an, an hour in one direction, uh, and we're, as I say, we're still confident on all the work we've done, it's still going to be a very good value for money project, but we're conscious we need to bring a, a robust cost estimate forward in the future. Uh, on Metro West End, uh, and this has come up several times um, about how we're serving the west of the city. So it, it is important to say that we do have a transport strategy in place, which sets a framework for the overall development of transport around Dublin. And you know, a lot of work went into to doing, to preparing that. It then has, has a ministerial approval behind it, and it's a statutory plan. And within that plan, the west of the city wasn't ignored. So there were two key lines that are proposed to be built in the first 10 years and the third one then to follow afterwards. So that's the DART to uh, Maynooth is the first one and that's in the National Development Plan to put in DART services out as far as Maynooth on the Maynooth line and DART on the Kildare line out as far as uh, Selbridge at least. Uh, and we're proceeding to actually move that project on 
and uh, we would hope that in the next month we will be out to tender or kicking off a tender process to acquire the fleet to put in place those dart services in the coming years. So the NDP has, has, those, has those two dart lines as part of the NDP to, develop, to be developed over the next uh, before 2027. And then the, the NDP and our transport strategy does provide for a Lewis line to Lucan in the future. So the NDP doesn't include in the first 10 years but our transport strategy has, has it in. So there will be, as well as the red line that exists at the moment, there will be a Dart service, Minute line, a Dart service on a Kildare line, and a Lewis out to, um, out to Lucan. But we don't want to, it's important to remember that there is a bus system in there, and sometimes we, we kind of overlook it. And there's a lot of investment going in to put in an improved bus system out towards the west of the city through the Green Hills uh, corridor to Talla, the Clondalkin to Drimna corridor, the, Bally, uh, uh, the Liffey Valley Corridor and the Lucan Corridor. So there's a lot of investment going in into the west, uh, into the west side of Dublin to put in place good transport uh, links in the future uh, by virtue of those particular projects there. I might add to that. If that's okay. So we recognise that orbital movements in particular, you know, uh, there are strong orbital movements around the city as well. Um, but I think when we looked at it from the point of view of the strategy, we uh, believed, uh, certainly in 20 years' time, that those, those orbital uh, travel demands could be met by the bus system rather than a light rail system. Um, we will, in terms of the improvements to the network, be improving the level of service and the connections between um, the towns and villages, urban villages, on the west side through uh, making better connections by bus. Um, we introduced the 175 service um, uh, last year and that's been very successful in connecting City West across uh, to UCD and beyond and we will see those services uh, increasing um, over the number of over the next few years. So, uh, and I'm sorry I have to leave for leaders questions but you're saying oh there's a bus service there for somebody to get from Ongar to the city centre is taking an hour and 20 minutes at peak time. You know, I mean, this is not acceptable for people to be shoved out to areas and told, oh, well, you have a bus service, you know. Like, it's just anywhere beyond a certain mileage, you really should be looking at light rail. But also, all of these industrial parks don't have proper bus services, and they're clogging up. People are driving in from all over because they've no other way of getting in. And I'm just asking that the NTA will stay open to the idea of a light rail system for Blanchardstown and stop citing the rail line to Maynooth as being one that's, oh, you have a rail line there. But People we, can't get to it. We also have to be, uh, consider our transport strategy. You know, as Hugh said, a lot of work went into the development of that strategy. We looked at where the development uh, areas were going to be and we responded in terms of what transport infrastructure needs to be put in place for a, a developing city region and a Lewis to Blanchardstown was not considered uh, needed um, as part of our transport strategy for 20 years. How could it not be when the population doubled in, since the 1990s? Well, that's what has come out of our modelling and looking at what are the projected increases in travel demand across the city region. And when you have to look at it in, its, in the round, in terms of all the transport systems that are in place, rail, Lewis and bus, and the combination of those in terms of what we're proposing in our transport strategy, what's in our statutory transport plan, will meet the uh, travel demand uh, for 20 years if we put those, that infrastructure in place. Might bring you on a few journeys out there, maybe, and well, show the you that the bus is, service isn't sufficient. Well, that's what Bus Connects is about as well. It's about improving and improving the bus corridor so that we can reduce longer. the journey times. That's part of what we're putting forward uh, for public consultation at the moment, because we understand that uh, people don't want to be travelling uh, for long. Uh, journey times, you know, people don't want to be doing long journey times on the bus and we're trying to put in place the infrastructure that will reduce those journey times through the bus corridors proposals. Could I, could I just ask a very quick point on that? You've made the point in relation to Cherrywood and the requirement for Cherrywood because it's going to be a town. There's a town already in place, Blanchestown. I don't see how you can how you can make the argument for one and the need for one if you don't similarly make the the, the argument for the other. I mean, when this, the scenario testing was done, do you have the, the do you have the the figures in relation to that to, to that so that we can actually have a look at that? I think that would be quite useful to see that. 
it's all available, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think it's still on our website. We we, we did uh, we did sectoral uh, analysis of each of the sectors uh, to identify what the transport demand is with all the information we had from the census and other sources, and uh, uh, we we came up with what we believed was the appropriate transport framework for the for the overall city. Uh, but there is a rail line there, which will be a dart line. There is going to be bus services, uh, improved bus services, because we totally agree with you. The bus service, the time from Blanchestown to the city centre is too long, and it needs to be a whole lot shorter. And that's the core bus corridor pro uh, project, the Blanchestown to city centre one, is to do exactly that. So uh, okay, we, we don't disagree with you. I don't want to take up the whole meeting, but you know that's not going to resolve the problem, because people are getting clogged up once they get to, like, Stony Batter and places like that. So... We you actually need to get away from that. That's why potentially it wouldn't be the quickest route. Actually, the Phoenix Park would be the best route if you want to plonk a Lewis through there. We, we'd be in and out of town. No, but I'm just saying there's private transport going in there constantly, but yet there's no public transport. People actually can't get there without driving. So, but if you want to extend the Lewis from Broombridge, that will be another option. So. Um, it's just very, very disheartening for people to be told that you have a bus service there when it takes an hour and 20 minutes for parts of Ongar, etc. Any other questions that were already asked? Yeah, there's yeah. still quite a number to respond yeah. to. So um, I think uh, still on uh, Deputy Curran's questions about uh, the next stage, about concern relating to changes to the network in advance of the um, bus corridors being in place. Well. We believe that there is still benefit in making changes to the services because it would be making better connections across the city. Now, we, we don't know what those connections are going to be yet, and we'll be bringing those to your uh, attention in September um, when we have done and, uh, and revised the network on the basis of the submissions that we got. But we still think there's benefit uh, in providing that improved service, even in advance of the network or of the corridors being improved. You get additional benefit then when we have improved the corridors uh, in terms of journey times. But the network uh, um, benefits of making better connections uh, and integrating a, a much more integrated bus system, we think should not be held back until the, the uh, corridors improvements are just think that that would be just there be more options or there be shorter journey times? Um, it would be primarily by making uh, good connections you should be able to uh, do your journey shorter by not like not having to come into the city centre um, all the time to do your and that's because we'd be hoping to introduce a lot more orbital routes but the additional benefit that you would get on the main core corridors would also radically induce, it reduce the journey time as well. So it's, it, there will be a combination of, um, of benefits. That's where the real fear is. In advance of the corridors, you make all of these changes and people do not see the benefits. This is really, they buy it with the corridors. But in the absence of the corridors, to, to suggest to people, well, you get halfway into town, you get off and you get the other bus that was coming the other direction. Um, they've already probably queued for half an hour to get on the first bus and seen several go by. They're terrified of this. Because at rush hour, it's diff in the suburbs going in, it's difficult to get on the bus. Um, we, and when they're on it, they want to hold that seat. In the submissions, and we're obviously taking that into account when, in the redesign of, of the network. Um, in terms of a programme for increasing the fleet, yes, there is a, a programme to, as we want to increase the frequency of service, that we will um, put in place a programme to increase the fleet in line with the increased services. Deputy Munster. Yeah, just on the fee, it's actually gone up from about 980 just two years ago to 1125, which is a considerable increase uh, just in that period, and we know that more is needed. Uh, on Deputy Munster's queries, um, I, I think the key point, the key point you made at the beginning was should we have gone out and consulted with communities before we ever drew up any plan at all? We found from doing a myriad of consultations that, that the best way to start off is with something developed and give something for people to review, comment on, and, and give their feedback on. Going out with just a blank sheet of paper often doesn't help and usually ends up with, with far more um, annoyance over that approach than, than one of going out with, with a 
draft proposal, unfinished, and looking for people's views, which is where we, where we are. We went out with a proposal uh, that uh, wasn't fully, um, still had issues that had to be sorted out, looking for feedback, and I'd hope that when we revise it later this summer, we'll have addressed a lot of the concerns that, that, that will have been raised. Uh, Sorry, I just done that. It wasn't to go out with a blank piece of paper. It was a consultation to um, ask people their needs, requirements in relation to work, living in the community, access in the community. So from that you could you know, develop an idea of what, what their actual needs are before you'd formulate a plan. We have a lot of that information already. The, the census, for instance, provides information about where people live, where they're travelling to, the time they leave, the mode of transport. And we have that and numerous other sorts of information. So we actually have a, an enormous database of that type of information. So uh, I'm not saying we're, we had a, everything complete in terms of knowledge and that. We didn't, but we had enough to certainly prepare a draft plan, which is what, what we did. Uh, on the, issue of Metrolink and writing to the property owners and not to other people, um, we were very conscious that property owners are the most affected people because you're interfering with their property. So, the, 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 sorry, I, should, sorry, I shouldn't have said Metrolink, bus connects. Uh, so they're the ones we focused on, on writing individually to and going as far as offering all of them a one-to-one -one meeting to discuss the project as it affected them. The, the type of issues that were particular to them and, and, and other things that needed to be taken into account. So um, that was the reason why we focused on them as opposed to writing to, to every single person across across the city effectively. Uh, in terms of how we're going to deal with the, the residential tenants and the property owners of the properties affected, we've put forward in the document that was published yesterday um, that if we take College Gate uh, apartments that we are going to assist the tenants there uh, who will have plenty of advance notice, uh, these are tenants now, with plenty of advance notice of when the building will be acquired if the scheme is approved, because we're we're, 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 we have to make, we have to go through a process with on board Panola and it has to be approved or otherwise. So if it's approved, they will be given uh, plenty of notice. We'll work with them to find alternative accommodation and we've committed to paying a year's, uh, a, a year's rent for those tenants uh, in regard to that relocation. And then for property owners there, uh, owner occupiers, we've committed to put in place assistance to actually assist them in finding alternative property. And then the compensation system that the state has kicks in to compensate them appropriately for the property being acquired. So uh, I think we've, we have a, a, the right approach, I think, at least to dealing with those people, uh, and, and we hope to continue with that. Uh, Deputy Murphy, then. Just on that, sorry, just uh, very quickly, just in relation to the increase in buses and the frequency, I know you've, you've touched on it there a moment ago, but I mean, you'll know yourself as it stands, it's totally insufficient. It's, you know, they're, they're, as I said, there's three buses passing people at, at rush hour before they, they can get onto a bus. So, in, in what you said in your response that they've already increased it, but I'm just not comfortable, you know, if bus connects is to, is to, um, to work and you're going, you know, along orbital routes and you're going to have more people coming out onto those routes that would have otherwise maybe got it, you know, closer to home or whatever. So what, what plans, concrete plans have you to increase buses and the frequency of buses? so that this doesn't become an even bigger issue. I'll just respond to that. Um, like we are constantly reviewing um, with our operators um, the existing bus services and where there's a requirement for additional frequency um, and additional um, requirement in terms of new services. Um, and obviously there's always a, an issue at peak times, you know, and we try and put in as much capacity at peak times as possible, um, but there will be occasions when the demand uh, exceeds the capacity, particularly at peak times. But I, I would like to, you know, uh, to point out that we've made, and there has been a considerable increase in the frequency in the Dublin region, um, and with Bus Erin in terms of the services that they operate into the from the region uh, around Dublin, and in the regional cities as well. So it's not just Dublin-based. 
We've just introduced uh, with Dublin Bus uh, a new route 155 from Bray across to IKEA, and that's added in a significant amount of capacity in uh, to the system. So I would say that over even uh, one to two years, uh, the last year and into this year, we'll be adding uh, approximately 10% capacity into the uh, fleet and the network in Dublin to uh, meet those uh, services, and a similar quantity uh, with bus air in terms of meeting the demand. And we'll continue to review on a constant basis where the demand um, is being exceeded by um, the capacity and see, subject to the funding that we have, whether we can put in place additional frequency of services. Just a question. Over, oh, sorry. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Just on Deputy Mark's queries. Yes, we're, we're conscious that a lot of the growth is happening away from the centre, and certainly the west side of the city is getting a, a, a large chunk of that. I, I, I kind of have to repeat what I said there earlier, that we are putting a dart service on the Kildare line, which is, you know, going to be, I think, a phenomenal addition to 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 all the the locations along that particular line there. The Minute line I've mentioned that's further north. Uh, and then it is the bus system beyond that that we do want to make the improvements to it and our capacity to it. Um, and if I move on to uh, uh, the, the Green Line connection, because we have recognised that the Green Line will need to be upgraded to Metro in the future, the tunnel boring works we're doing now is, is being brought as far as is needed to make that future connection without in, at a point in the future without having to do more tunnel boring. So the connection in the future will be from the surface downwards. So uh, that's what the scheme, the Metrolink scheme, is, is lined up to achieve now. So considering flexibility to divert it to another location, I think was the essence of your question. The, the issue is, what happens to the Green Line then? The Green Line is going to be over capacity at a point in the future. We need to, to be upgraded. The, the issue would be, what would you do if you weren't, uh, if, if you are going elsewhere? And I'll leave aside the fact that that's our transport strategy even, and it, it would, would be undermining it to be uh, pointing in a different direction. I think the, the timeline for residents moving out of College Gate, it's, we have to wait till the Board Penal approves the scheme if they approve it, and it'll certainly be a period of time after that. So I guess we're talking uh, three plus years anyway, and it could be five years. So someplace in that range, three to five years uh, is the timeline. On you asked about tram purchasing and the timeline for, for, for purchasing trams for, for the metro system. They would probably, the orders would probably be placed about halfway during the construction period. They will need about four years uh, advance ordering at least. So I, I imagine 2022 or 2023 is when the orders would be placed for that. And it wouldn't affect the, the placement of the order for the heavy rail fleet. As I think I said earlier, the tender process to procure dart fleet that will go on to the northern line, the Kildare line, the Minute line, that process will kick off literally next month, so uh, uh, the metro trams won't interfere with that process. Uh, just, just on that, that point, I mean, obviously there's a capacity constraint as we yeah. as we speak, particularly yeah. at peak times, it's a, there's a real issue that, like, w once you get to... Uh, League Slip Confi, it's standing all the way in and all the stations in at peak time at this stage. And there's a, the lead in, it, it is, the lead in is really important because there's already an issue there. Um, will the existing trains or the trains that will be purchased now, will they be compatible with uh, the electrified service, the ones that you're going to be buying in? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. And some of them will be by mode, be able to run on the line. Uh, they have in, to be. Yeah, in advance of electrification. So, uh, no, that's that's the intention. And is there, is there any information on how that capacity constraint can be dealt with in the shorter term? Is there, is there I mean, people have been talking about buying in, uh, you know, previously owned <coughs> carriages. Um, and if, if, if that's the case, would that compatibility still be the case as a, a short-term fix for a long-term problem? Uh, yeah, we, we absolutely know there is a problem in the in the peak hour at the moment on the rail. And just to say again, there is no spare rail fleet at the moment to put out on, into service during the peak hours. All of the available fleet is in service. And unfortunately, there is no quick answer to it. So the new DART fleet will be 2023 before it starts to arrive. So we have been, there are two other options that are still uh, being worked through. One is 
could we acquire a second hand fleet? Uh, where would it come from and how much modification is needed because the Irish gauge, the distance between the two tracks is different from virtually every other European country. So any fleet that comes in would have to be modified. So we're still working through what that would mean and whether it's worth doing or not. And the second option is that uh, is to look at acquiring some more of non-DART type fleet that were purchased uh, a number of years ago. They're called the intercity rail cars. They were, there was a large number purchased about six or seven years ago and to purchase some more of those carriages to extend existing, uh, those existing uh, train sets. So one or other or both of those solutions we'll be making decisions on in the next couple of months. We did have word from Irish Rail, sorry to harp on this, but we did have word from Irish Rail that when they went out to uh, to purchase that it was it, the, the, the cost was actually prohibitive. Is there any change on that? That was a, a refurbishment contract to oh, furbish right, so uh, yeah. 28 carriages yeah. that have been in storage yeah. for, for a long number of years. Yeah. And the problem was that only one tender was received. The cost of refurbishment was almost three quarters the price of yeah. new fleet. And it was also going to take a considerable period of time. So they'd be you know, a year to two years away from... A, from so that's, still, that's off the table? Unfortunately, so, okay. we, we had to conclude that value for money and that yeah. couldn't stand okay. over it. Uh, and lastly, I think you asked about will there be consultation in the outer part of Bus Connect. I think you meant the bus services consultation. Is that what you meant yes, by that? It, yeah. Mean, there's the, yeah, there's, there's, there, there was some public consultation and there was modifications. We haven't seen those modifications on the that, periphery of the city, if you like. That's September, September. When, when we're going out with those. Right, okay. And can I just acknowledge that I've seen an increase in bus services. There's been you know, Sunday services and all sorts of things have, uh, and, and new routes have appeared. So I do acknowledge that there is you know, there is most definitely progress. Um, and I think it's important to be balanced and to say that as well. Um, I'll take up Deputy Coppinger uh, yeah. was talking about areas uh, to the west being bereft. And I think we've covered that in our responses that in terms of the strategy um, and Metro West, we've already uh, responded to that and Lewis to Blanchardstown. Um, and extension from Broombridge to Blanchestown. So again, it's just that it's not in our strategy um, and we believe that what's proposed and what we're working on uh, is delivering the strategy and um, we will continue to work on that. Just on the point, is there any additional information you could uh, give Deputy Carpenter in relation to that? If there yeah. is, if there is, uh, after this meeting. Yeah, if it's not it available be, on, our, on our website, we'll, we'll right. make sure that it's available well, to all the deputies does, here. Yeah, just make sure that she gets it if you can. Yeah, certainly. Because will. it's a fair point. And then uh, your own chairman's uh, response, you will pick up those. On your own point uh, about um, the estuary park and ride, there's a long-term park and ride at estuary station for the metro, which is 3,000 plus. 3, it could even turn out to be bigger. Right. And I think we did say to go Fingal County Council, which funded by ourselves, we'll bring forward a proposal for a, for a bus-based park and ride in the interim. I actually don't have an up-to-date position on it just here. So today. how many, well, I, I like when the fact, but it'll be, I, I, how, do you know how many how many car parks will be there, I, car parking spaces? Or? I don't know, so perhaps okay. we'll drop you a note. Look, I like on the fact that you're working <coughs> on it, that you go to fast track. Yeah. Obviously, the quicker you do it, the better, because uh, I can tell you that the average speed on the, on the M1 almost at any hour of the day, it's probably, it's below 80 kilometres per hour. Uh, a day and night I travel, it also, it's always packed and it's always slow and it's always very frustrating. And as many of those cars you can get off, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I know I have two, two members now, um, Deputy Ryan and Senator Humphrey, so you may... Thank you very much. Very welcome to get this opportunity to discuss both the Metro and Bus Connects projects. If I can start just on the Metro, and I very much appreciated the briefing we got yesterday uh, following your announcement of your latest uh, preferred route alignment. And obviously I'm, I'm going to focus, if I can, on the, on the, on, on the South Side uh, as a South Side TD. Um, I'm very aware that the, um, that the alignment, preferred alignment from the NTA, as I understand, kind of bringing the... Uh, Metro onto the Green Line goes back quite some time, 20 years, uh, the original decision to build the bigger bridge in Dundrum to cater for it, widen the tracks. Um, the, the difficulty we ran into in, in the section from Dundrum to Ranelagh, it's not just a Ranelagh is issue where um, 
using a, what I think I understand the NTA want to use a driverless segregated system, it wasn't kind of understood that the effects that would have in terms of affecting the accessibility of the line is a real issue. And some people kind of, you know, depict people in, in certain areas as, oh, they're just nimbyist or whatever. But actually, there is a fundamental transport principle, I think, around trying to promote, I'm sure you'd agree, pedestrian accessibility as best we can and cycling accessibility. Uh, and that did present real difficulties. It's clear that the, any solutions to that, um, in, from your own research, uh, has a difficulty in that the potential closure of a line for two years um, would, be, would have huge knock-on consequences for the rest of the network. Um, I was very glad that the Taoiseach yesterday, in responding to all questions, indicated, as I understand, his or government's position that, given that circumstance, rather than just delaying 20 years before we we carry out the possible the, the works to, to, to kind of connect the metro to the green line that we should and could consider alternative route alignments. Uh, I know from the start I've been advocating that we should look to the southwest because I know it is also and, and I've heard other deputies here acknowledging that there's a there's every area of the city is Blanchestown is a nightmare uh, as everyone acknowledges and uh, and uh, and we could pick any other quarter of the city but but that southwest quadrant is also a nightmare in transport terms and, and uh, advocation the, the potential to keep the tunnel machine going to the southwest to serve it. The other option, I suppose, um, the Taoiseach particularly favoured, um, running instead to the southeast to UCD and uh, maybe hope to, within the consultation period to come back with some ideas on this, um, has the real advantage that, well, UCD and other sections along that line, if you had a stop in Sandy and uh, Slorgan, where there's another big development um, likely planned, but particularly if you can connect from UCD to uh, Sandyford, we, in a sense, would solve a lot of the long-term capacity concerns on the Green Line because we would have the ability to, co to divert traffic coming from Cherrywood or, or Sandyford onto that direct metro route, um, and that would be, uh, I think, a very good engineering solution because the entire line would be designed with this driverless segregation system in mind. It would pick up on very busy transport location destination points where, where there's significant growth projected. I've seen the plans for UCD, massive development, increase in student population, increase, increase in, in all sorts of development in, in that area and in Sandyford. So it's, it, it would be picking up on very large development centres. And as I understand, the president of UCD said this morning, I was quoting the papers this morning, it also really brings the prize of connecting the north side and the south side of the city, or connecting our three universities, three of our universities, we, we, we have others now in Dublin, but um, that connection between DCU and Trinity and UCD as a strategic benefit to the city would be immense. And I think he's right to quote the president of Boston where they connected Harvard, MIT and the city centre and they saw took off as an innovation hub. And we should, we should aim to think that way in Dublin of, of, of really creating an enterprising connected city, which this would do. So I, I want to very much encourage the NTA, you know, we are in a consultation phase and I think it's fully appropriate in public consultation to be able to consider alternatives. You know, we're, we can't just do public consultation as a fait accompli or, or just around the small technical changes. It should require, or should give us the possibility of looking at that sort of realignment, which is a significant change, but I think would, would deal with the technical problems we've run up against, would be huge benefits to, in terms of connectivity within the, the, uh, the city that we need to do everywhere else as well. But, but in this particular instance, we have a tunneling machine there coming south of the Liffey in seven, eight years' time. We have to, six years' time, whatever period, we have to work out what we're going to do with it. And I think that, uh, that sort of alternative alignments um, really does make sense. So I, I'm just keen to get your sense is um, uh, as to uh, just responds to that in terms of the actual, I know there'll be all sorts of legal and planning and difficulties in terms of you, you, you already have your transfer plan which said we would upgrade the green line. I'd be arguing back with said we can change plans. Our, our system has to be flexible enough to, be, to adapt um, and not just wait five years to look at another plan and then start it again. I, I just don't think we can leave the tunneling machine or, or stop and wait 20 years. And, and I think and even then, waiting 20 years, what, which is still going to be a very difficult uh, engineering problem where we 
we have to either restrict pedestrian access in a way that we don't want to do, or else close a line for 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 a period. So, I, as much as anything else, I want to just uh, support that approach. Not maybe it, it may be difficult for you because it's coming from a political system who, who may be looking for this, and, and you'll probably rightly come back and say, oh, well, we have to adhere to legislation and we have to um, and make sure that we're not going to be caught up in the planning system or the courts and someone challenging it. I think the political system may have to give you very clear direction in that regard in the coming year, six months, and um, uh, just to flag that. If I can put the bus connection at the same time, Chair, is that a cipher? Um, that's kind of a long, but a, a, a cry for consideration of that alternative. Um, on the metro, on the bus connects, I, I, I've been to, a, I don't know how many now, of the public consultation events you've at, and I just have to say, I think Mr. Cregan, I've seen you there, a large number of them, and I appreciate the calm and reasoned and uh, open approach that I've seen from the NTA to the consultation process. I think it's been uh, a good exercise. Not easy. There's a lot of anger out there, and there's a lot of concern, and, and that's valid too. That deserves to be heard. Uh, I'm very supportive of the Bus Connects project. We've got a critical transport crisis in our city. It's not been helped by the fact that we're widening every approach road to Dublin, which doesn't make any sense to me. Where we're widening every single motorway has been widened, and we're thinking about chopping down every tree and cutting down every front garden. I'm exaggerating there, but we have to stop widening the approach roads to Dublin. We have to stop the traffic coming in. What are we doing? But anyway, when it comes to the bus network, it's going to be very local in my own specific constituency, or even a couple of corridors within it, where the public consultation meetings have been very useful and, uh, and detailed, um, the Rathfarnham and Kimmage corridors. It seems to me, and the one question I have to you in this regard is, um, we do have a problem with the continuation on, in a lot of roads with the four-lane, four-carriageway, um, six if you include cycleways, um, design, which in roads like Kimmage Road Lower from Sun Drive Road up to the KCR, Turnier Road East, Rathgar Road, Turnier, um, Rathfarnham Road, um, it is presenting real difficulties in terms of a fairly massively extensive actually removal of front gardens, removal of trees, and, and also just creating a streetscape where I'm really fearful will not be a street, it will be a major distributor road. And, and we don't want, they go through urban villages and, and residential communities where living in a distributor road is a totally different experience to living in on a, on a street. Now, at the same time, we need to protect the bus speeds and absolutely improve the bus times and services, so I'm 100% committed to, to that. It does seem to me that there's a technical alternative solution that may help. I'm particularly welcome in regard to the plans of those two corridors to take them for the moment, on, on that we are starting to look at measures that would actually reduce the amount of traffic, true traffic, without blocking access. The likes of the proposal on Rathmines Main Street, where it would be a one-way system uh, for cars, the likes of the HB Street um, plan restricting traffic from Bride Street, the likes of the bus gate in Harold's Cross, and I know there are difficulties around that locally, but, but that I think is the approach we need to take. It, it's recognising that we're a peak car, we can't cope, we've got to restrict traffic and, while trying to maintain access. And, and my view is that if, by doing that, and while, while doing that, we could also, rather than doing a four-lane approach on the sort of roads I mentioned, look at a three-lane staggered approach where if you're giving the bus and making sure at the bus light that it's getting through every time, and you are seeing other reductions in traffic, which I'm sure you can model, it should be possible for us to run the bus on the correct speed and, and, and timetable without necessarily having to, for the first three, four hundred metres, what, five hundred metres, whatever, of that section of road to provide the bus lane. The buses will always be ahead of the traffic and make it a general shared lane. And in that staggered approach, we may address, and this is just one issue in bus next, but it's an important one, we may be able to reduce the amount of curtilage we would have to take and also reduce the character of the road from being a major distributor route to being a more retaining some of the residential character and the urban character of those areas. So that's my main question on the bus connects is, is do you see that having uh, as an option? Um, and it's not just a, it applies to Nutley Lane, it applies to I'm sure loads of other areas where you've got similar difficulties, but it's particularly significant I think in the sort of corridors are, that, I've, that, that I've mentioned. Thank you. Take uh, I'm sorry, Senator Humphreys. I'm happy if the answers come to. Oh, no, okay, no, I tell you, we've other, we have time pressure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a few ask your questions now. And I'm being rude. And thank you for taking the chair. While okay. That's the way. No, that's very. Uh, yeah. Can I just start in relation to uh, Hugh Creedon's answers in relation to College Gate? 
Um, now, I, I still hope, hope that College Gate is still under consideration for uh, a slight realignment in, in relation to property that's around there and proposals that are there. I know one of the site creates a difficulty in relation to the main sewer line. Um, and if that can be resolved, can the particular station be moved at that stage, still giving you the integrated transport? Uh, and I would ask during the public the further public consultation period that a proper costing in relation to that sewer line, which uh, would then open up alternative options. And failing that, um, the, the, the normal CPO mechanism for, for College Gate is not going to work. It, it, it's, in, it's, it's a community within the city. Uh, that has been there now for, 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 for several years, and there's a mixture of, of tenants and owner-occupiers. Uh, in relation to the own, owner-occupiers, the current um, CPO system will not allow them to stay within their own community if it's carried out as such, and I would ask for that to be examined and looked at. I think College Gate is, is very different than anywhere else because of its lo location. People that purchased their homes uh, a two-bedroom home in College Gay um, during the recession got it at a, you know, what people would say is a good price now. Um, but if they want to stay within their community, there's got to be a huge gap between what is a compulsory purchase price and a compensation price than what they can purchase in the immediate area. And I have to take that. That has to be taken into consideration. They can't be you know, you know, banished out of the communities they have lived, with, lived there now for their decades. And similar to the tenants, the tenants again has a thing. So like, I, I really just don't believe the, the one-year system will, will work that you're proposing. Um, can I just jump back in relation to, to the bus corridors? And uh, I think Eamon has outlined this out that we don't want that streetscape change. And I think, in, in fairness, uh, Mr. Creedon, you have worked with me when I brought forward proposals and suggestions uh, to resolve some of these issues, and not all of those issues can be resolved. But one of the concerns I have, and, 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 and in an effort to bring forward constructive su suggestions on how, how this can be, uh, can be resolved. Um, as, you, as you're probably aware, that the, the real-time data for the buses are, is, is open data, so it's, it's freely and easily accessible. Uh, and there seems to be a, a big difference between the times that you're putting out in the consultation documents and the, uh, the open data sources that we've been able to access in the real time. Um, uh, and the difference in data is, is up to 40 per cent. So I'm just kind of asking you, is can we, can we go back and check your data sources? Uh, we have 20, 28, 29 days of data now, and there's, 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 there's large differences in, in the times that you're putting forward and what has actually been shown by that real-time data, and then by examples and things that, are, are, that have been taken there. But I, I do believe that we need now is, is that kind of local consultation in relation to where people are bringing forward uh, constructive solutions, uh, and I, I would be a big supporter of, pub, of public transport. At the, at the very beginning, in, in relation going back to, to the metro system, is, is, is I always have said is no decision would be a worse decision for, for local communities. Uh, in relation to the Charlemagne Street line now, I, I think we've hit a, we've hit a worse solution uh, by building a, a bus park uh, under Renla. Uh, I think you've, you've sent a clear indication uh, that you are going to extend the uh, Lewis Green Line. And maybe you could just m give me a better uh, technical term than perhaps uh, 20 years. Uh, I'm sure we have some real uh, modelling that will actually tell us what time you're, in what time frame you're talking about extending. Uh, so when, like, you, you, it's not, a, fi it's not a, a technical term I've come across before in relation to perhaps so, like anybody living along that line now that wish to right size or downsize will actually take the financial de depreciation on their properties uh, and probably not be able to move into suitable accommodation because it will be an automatic discount. And this, this has happened numerous times uh, in relation to, to plans, uh, certainly within Dublin City. Uh, if, if you look at the uh, Marion Gates flyover that was proposed by the NTA, 
you know, any property searches that come up there now, it's it's next to impossible to sell a property uh, if if you want to move on because they looked at there's a road reservation in the front garden, yet there's no there's no negotiation in relation to future uh, compulsory purchases, and we've seen similar in, in other locations. We see uh, sterilisation of, of of a track of land in relation to the eastern bypass. So I, I think we need to, to give a little bit more certainty rather than the word perhaps, uh, where people can actually um, understand what your future uh, plans are and proper timescales in, in relation to this. Uh, I certainly believe th that there is two options that were outlined very clearly uh, by Deputy Ryan. One is connecting uh, UCD uh, or uh, taking the line forward or westward and collecting, connecting uh, Hartles Cross, uh, Kimmich on up into the Raffarm bus corridor, which is taking over 70,000 uh, passengers. Uh, I think it, it, so like there is a demand. And one final question, I know you're quite for time. Like I believe public transport in this city should be starting to be planned on a 100-year basis, not on a very short-term basis. One of the things that which I, I, I give great respect to the, um, in relation to swords, they've already taken the decision in relation to height and density uh, on the expectation that the metro system will, will go out there. Uh, and when you, when you furnish data in relation to the uh, viability of taking the metro link uh, westward, if you take into consideration and working with local authorities of, of changing the density and height in the locations along the metro line could actually make the metro, metro line much more uh, uh, financially sustainable. But I always believe there always has to be a, 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 a subsidy to public transport because there's other positive gains for a city and a community. And the last point uh, that the NTA, I believe, really has to take on board uh, uh, is that the city is made up of villages. And in some way, we have to ensure that those villages are not destroyed by the proposals, uh, that we don't change the streetscape in such a, such a sta to such an immense stage, is that there's no longer uh, a viability of that. And l living through the, uh, the Lewis Line and Harcourt Street, there ha whatever uh, construction proposals come in, there has to be supports put in for small businesses to make sure that they can exist during, the re during any major proposal like this, because a lot of the businesses on the um, Harcourt Street line never reopened. They closed during the period, but never reopened. So any business that we would lose during the construction of Bus Connect, we have to look and we have to work imaginatively with the local authorities, whether we need to, to consider uh, rate reductions, whatever, in relation to take consideration a loss of business during the construction period, because you know, small businesses and small shops that are hardly just hanging in there. You can't say, well, this is going to be great. You're going to get more people into, the, in, into, into your village, which will be uh, more business for yourself if you can't stay open during the period. That shop closes, that small business closes. It more than likely will never reopen. Thank you. Okay. Just uh, taking up Deputy Ryan's uh, point about um, the strategy and, and changing um, the metro line uh, now to UCD um, and connecting with Sandyford. Um, and the Deputy would know that um, we do need to provide the infrastructure um, and do it on the basis of our existing uh, transport strategy, um, which is a statutory plan. And any changes to any alignment um, would require a change to our statutory document. And there's a time period involved in delivering a change to the transport strategy. We ha do and we are required, and our strategy has to be adaptable, of course, to changing uh, circumstances. And there is an allowance in our legislation to review our transport strategy every six years. And we will be proposing to do that uh, and start that work um, next year, uh, towards the end of next year. And we believe it's at that time that any uh, changes or potential changes to alignment, um, it's then that you would consider um, whether a proposal to go to UCD instead of um, upgrading the metro, um, the green line to metro level of service, that's the time um, to consider that. But if we 
make changes to our plans now. It means that the, our transport strategy would have to change. There's a two to three year period involved in, in developing a transport strategy, getting it statutorily approved, and then delaying the process for the whole Metrolink. And we don't think that is something that um, we should bring forward at this stage. If I could just briefly come in on that. Uh, I think there's absolute agreement there can be no delay in the broader project. And, uh, and you obviously clearly we have to do things within the legislative and other mechanisms. But um, we have a real transport crisis in our city. We're facing two billion a year, as I understand, congestion car charges from because we're just such a car dominated city. We have, I understand, and recall from our separate work we're doing in the Climate Action Committee, I think you, you re replied to a question I asked, when the estimate, even with Metro and Bus Connects, we're looking at a 30% increase in transport emissions in Dublin by 2030, when we need is a 30% reduction at least. So we have an absolute crisis. And I know in our Climate Action Committee and others, there, there's going to be a whole range of measures going to have to be taken in other sections of society where we're going to have to be quick and um, resolute in, in our approach. So we won't resolve it here today. I hear what you say on that, but I think the political system will be coming back to you and saying, looking for ways in which we can speed up that process because, um, and even if, the, if it's for some reason, whatever, it's, it's ruled out or not agreed, the, the, the general approach of kind of delaying uh, transport infrastructure is the last thing we can be doing now. In my mind, do we have to? And as we have that tunnel machine coming south of the Liffey, um, it would be a tragedy if it's not actually used in a, in a really productive way. As part, and, and other parts of the city are going to have to get similar dramatic increase, in my mind, of the scale of public transport investment we're going to make. And I think that strategy is probably going to be challenged and changed in other ways because we're going to have to ramp up what the climate agreement we're going to have to do with the European Union is going to say is our plans are not sufficient. The National Development Plan had no climate assessment done of it. There's a legal challenge against that, rightly in my mind. And we are facing a European Union who are not going to give us an out now on our climate emissions targets. We're going to have to do dramatically so much more on transport that any plan is not fixed in my mind. And particularly where we have a, a project where, we, where this is a variation and I think any court or any planning system would look and say, yes, in the consultation process, people came with alternative suggestions. And it's a, it, it's a, if we don't actually allow public consultation, which allows for such variation, that actually would say it's not proper public consultation. But we won't go into, I mean, I think it is proper public consultation, but we shouldn't get caught in the weeds of timelines for statutory plans that, that, that see us missing an opportunity is the one point I'd make. And if that requires political action in terms of legislative or other measures, I think that's possible for us to do. It will be possible for us to do. But we, I think it, we have to work very fast now to do the modelling and do as best we can quickly the assessment of those alternatives, because I think the political system will be coming looking for it because we have this challenge. Well, that's a matter for the political system if they want to bring that forward, but I would uh, suggest that the danger is that it would have an impact on delivery of Metrolink uh, as it is proposed and has been put forward in the preferred route. And, and there is a risk associated with that and just that we will be pointing out what that risk is. So um, certainly, of course, the political system can come to us and, and request us to do that work and we, if we will carry out the work as requested. But there is a danger in terms of the delivery of the Metrolink um, project uh, as it is set out in the preferred route. And we'll have to avoid that, that outcome. Okay. Just so, a few plans. more. Just, yeah, one sorry. more uh, for, for Deputy Ryan, uh, which was the, the issue of the four lanes, the bus lane and the, and the traffic in each direction, and whether we can go for a three-lane staggered arrangement. Um, the short answer is that may be possible in places, but we have to be very conscious that we're, we're building this for the future, and if that if the if the queuing extends back beyond the bus lane area into the combined lane, which I, I, I know you're proposing we try and avoid, that's where we end up with problems. But it's it's there may be cases there may be places where that is the appropriate solution. So we're not we're going to look at that. There's also another way of getting to a, a three lane arrangement to, to reduce the line take, and that's in in one or two places. A one way route for a section, a one way piece of street may be appropriate. We would. We've already had discussions with one or two groups uh, about whether that was appropriate in their particular locality. So uh, th both of those options are available. 
and we'll explore them as part of the... Scum to point if I can. We're going to develop Dublin as a city similar to Copenhagen or Amsterdam or Utrecht. We're going to have a cycling population, I believe, in 30... I think Deputy uh, Humphrey is absolutely right, we should think long term. In the long term, this city is not going to be dominated by cars. It's going to be dominated by bikes, buses and rail system. The bike capacity is going to close, is going to reduce the amount of cars on the road. Think long term, it's not for continuing to provide the existing car system. It's a completely different city, one that's going to be a much better city. Why not? That's, that's where we're going in my mind. And in those contexts, we can start to think not about always providing for the car, but, but, but providing for those alternatives. But you've been at a number of those meetings and you saw the temperature of the room and there was very few people jumping up and saying that let, let's provide bus lanes or let's provide cycle lanes on some of these I routes. Think, I think there's a huge population in Dublin who think that way now. Yeah. I think actually there's a ginormous demand. It's a pent-up demand. No one will go Sorry. on the roads because uh, it's dangerous. I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying there. I fully support uh, the principle. Uh, but I want to hear... Uh, oh, sorry, Paul, yeah. No, 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 I'm very happy to hear you talk any time. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> in fact, I go to your party conference. Uh, I'm only joking all. Sorry, uh, Senator Humphreys. Uh, College Gate, you mentioned a good few things about College Gate. We really did a lot of work on College Gate to see could we, uh, could we avoid having to proceed with the proposal we went forward with. And uh, the honest position is we think that the proposal we went forward with previously is still the right proposal. None of the alternatives um, are satisfactory. They've all got issues with them. We will be putting together, uh, putting on the, the Metrolink website in the days ahead, I don't think it's there yet, but say in a in, in number of days, a comprehensive report setting out all of the options that were looked at and what the issues were, were with each one, and people have the opportunity to review that. And I, I certainly think they'll take from that that there was a lot of efforts made to see how we could avoid uh, having to remove those apartments. And unfortunately, in this case, we haven't been able to do that. On the CPO system, and it, 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 the normal CPO process work, won't work correctly, we're sort of acknowledging that in what we put forward. The idea of uh, compensating tenants for up to one year's rental in another location, that's outside the CPO process. That's beyond what the CPOs would normally require, because rental tenants, by their nature, only have a fixed tenancy, usually. Uh, so we're going to go above and beyond that. And for the owner-occupiers, we are going to put in place that system of trying to find a location, of assisting them in finding a location uh, or a return of accommodation in a suitable location, which, as you said, they're part of a community at this stage. So they'll be looking to be presumably uh, accommodated as part of someplace else in that community and we're going to do all we can to assist them. So I think it's, it's fair to say, uh, I totally agree with you, normal compensation just isn't, uh, rules just aren't enough. We are going above and beyond that. <coughs> to pick up some of the other things, the streetscape uh, issues on the streets, um, we're very conscious of that. We've gone out and consulted with people and it, and it is a big issue, not just taking gardens, but what the road is going to look like afterwards. So. We're appointing design teams for the project over the next uh, month or so. All of those design teams will have uh, urban uh, realm architects as part of it, and we'll be making that a key focus of the project that we end up with, not just a transport project, but a project whereby we respect the character of the, of the areas it goes through. On the, the bus data and the access people have to the open source, that's, that, that's understood. Just to say that when they look at the open source, the issue is the variability in the buses. So we haven't put out a single number and said every bus journey is X minutes. We've had to put out and say journeys are up to this, and we haven't even gone to the most extremes. But uh, the data we've, we've used in our documentation comes from what's called the automatic vehicle location data on the buses themselves, of which we have access to all of that. So the calculations that were done came from that system. Uh, and it shows you, if nothing else, the vast variability in bus time. So one day it's one time, the next day it's another time, and people find it hard to plan their journeys with confidence on that basis. Uh, on the sterilisation of properties uh, along the Green Line and the time scale for, for, for the upgrade of the Green Line, the proposals to upgrade the Green Line to Metro will largely be the proposals that we published last year. So people will have seen What's, what the impacts would be and what the changes would be. It might vary slightly, but that's the broad outline. In terms of its timescale, 
uh, we've said in our documentation yesterday that we believe we can get the Green Line to function for up to about 20 years, so uh, close to that time period uh, it's going to have to change uh, and we don't have any more detailed information uh, on that yet. And on the, the issue of a, a metro deviating, uh, I think Anne is into another direction out towards uh, the Ratfarnham area. I think Anne has covered the, the impact on the strategy of making change at this stage. Uh, and as you do acknowledge, it would require significant development of change, approach changes to make it uh, a slightly higher density. And I think unless you tell me otherwise, uh, that, that probably covers... Can, can I just have a point of clarity, to, to Chair, if you don't mind? And just in answer to, to Deputy Ryan's uh, question, you gave a timeline in relation to the review. So you're looking at a review uh, at the end of 2020, uh, which then would take two to three years. So in fact, what we're saying is there would be no change, because if you, if you stay to that timeline, uh, it would be four years. You would already have entered uh, contract, contracts. In relation to that, so like, so if if uh, it's either to go further to the west or down to UCD, we, we need to actually take action now. Uh, and if I read the response to the Taoiseach uh, yesterday as well, where he indicated, uh, and I'm open to this, I'd, I'd like to see the modelling to see which whether it would be best to go to west or out through to out to UCD. So re really, I think, in response to the Taoiseach's uh, response yesterday, I think what we really need to see is the modelling. Uh, and I think there needs to be a political decision to request you to do the modelling, uh, to do, and to do the modelling now. Could the Commission that? I know we're not well, I, think, I, think, I think the first thing is that I'm under, I'm under a very significant time I, Now I understand no, no, that. No, no. I give you a very and, good and, chair. And one, one of this has to leave as well. But uh, there's no issue which can't be brought before us as a committee, you know, by members or, or whatever. So, yeah, and I'm quite sure that. Uh, to give the response to that, yeah. I'd be interested. It might just save a little bit of time. Uh, there would have been significant modelling done, obviously, for the development of the transport strategy. And we would have looked at that quadrant of the city and what um, should be, you know, what. I suppose mode should serve, particularly along the Slorgan corridor, which is really what serves UCD. Now, it was designed on the basis that the Green Line, uh, and considered was on the basis that the Green Line would be upgraded to Metro, and that you did have a DART expansion and DART improved DART service um, on the DART corridor as well. So, what's in the middle of that then is the <coughs> corridor that serves UCD at the moment, the Slorgan corridor, and on the in terms of the development of the strategy. That showed that the bus system, naturally, if both were, uh, were put in place, the bus system would be able to cater for um, the demand along the, st the Stillorgan corridor. But um, we can certainly go back and look at the modelling that was done in the lead up to the strategy, looking at those uh, and the options, the optioneering that would be done. But there would be a significant amount of work if we were now to do some modelling on a different proposal, which is uh, looking at. Um, the share what you have done is that the point you're making? We'll certainly look and share yeah. what, what we have done up to now. The corridor as well, which is the other option. Your figures, not mine, is you've seen a 17% increase in bus journeys in relation to that, and, and you've, you're seeing a, a, a higher than expectation uh, movement of public transportation and buses. So it's like if you look at the, the, the green line and the red line, the the, the passenger movements now on that Raffarm corridor. Is now coming very close to what it, what the Lewis is serving. No, it, it's it's not. Um, I mean, our estimates and the modelling that was done and has been done previously um, is that the a the demand, the travel demand along the Rathfarnham corridor would not support a Lewis or a Metro service, and we can certainly share that information yeah. also with the committee. Well, that's fair enough. Look, uh, the joint committee is now adjourned till. At uh, two thirty on the third of April, when we will meet with Sport Ireland, I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, for their for their attendance and for their full replies in every respect. So, thank you very much. That's it.